discussion. I'm Tim Sheasley, director of the SUNY Oneonta Art Gallery. This is our f the first of our fine arts editions. With me today is SUNY Oneonta Professor Emeritus of Art, Dan Young. Professor Young taught art and sculpture for 30 years at the college and retired in 1994. He is back for a showing of his work in the Martin Mullen Gallery that runs through October 25th. Welcome, Dan. Well, thank you. It's nice to be back. It's wonderful to have you. You know, I had you as a faculty um, teaching me ceramics over 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's an incredible privilege to work with you again and to see that you're producing some just fabulous new work. I mean, I'd love to talk with you about that uh, today. Um, I know you've transitioned from being working with clay and being a teacher, and that's how I knew you. But maybe you can tell me a little bit about how you've transitioned from teaching, what maybe that has had to do with your work, and how you've moved into painting. Yeah, yeah. It's a strange transition, isn't it? But it's something that uh, I've been wired for, uh, for many, many years, starting out as a very young person. But I really had issues with painting. I just couldn't mm -hmm. find a, a comfortable way to express my ideas on a canvas. But uh, when I was young, I, I happened at a very young age, in an actual elementary school actually, mm. the first painting that I ever saw was a reproduction, three by five inch reproduction of Bruegel's Wedding Dance. Mm. Now Bruegel's Wedding Dance, that's kind of a Midwestern pronunciation of Bruegel, but actually Dutch Flemish, you would not pr pronounce the E and the mm. U, so it would be Brochos <laughs> Wedding Dance. And I got that right when we went over and with my son-in-law and got that right. But um, um, there was something about that that on a, even on a three by five, and that was on the front end of a telephone directory. Hmm. Of all things. And uh, uh, I can't remember if it was in color or not, but I think it was. But I was attracted to that, and I and I I, I couldn't figure out why. You know, I I, I was I, I didn't want to paint that way, but I still was attracted to it. And later I found out that. It was not so much the subject matter us, but was the energy that was captured in all the different figures that were, that were engaged in all this different movement on the canvas. I was fortunate enough to see the original at the Detroit Art Museum when I was at Cranbrook. And I was walking down a staircase and all of a sudden there it was, right there in front of me. I was about three feet by five feet. And I saw that and I visited it again on a bigger scale. I was still attracted to it, and I and I kept working it through my mind in terms of the relationship of all this energy taking place. So, energy is very very important to me. Energy that I see not only in nature, energy that I see by people, energy that I see that people try to project out of themselves in conversational things such as uh, politicians and things of this nature. But. Uh, uh, I couldn't figure out how to, I didn't like that give on the canvas. I didn't care for that. And as, as I got older, I started working through the process and beginning to understand that, that all of these experiences that I had, travel, observation, I worked with Charlie Winters here in IRC, realizing how to uh, uh, do slides and looking through a slide developer, which allowed me then to, f to enlarge and focus my image uh, what I was looking at and, and concentrate on colors and things. It was an incredible experience. Um, but also just not having these kinds of interests was enough. I also had to put into things a terminology. What kind of, what kind of, what am I looking for? What can I, well, how can I express this energy thing? Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I zeroed in on line, texture, and plasticity. Those were three things. I actually taught that in my ceramic classes. And I thought, if I'm going to do it, they're going to do it. And we actually did small introductory pieces where they would, I would remove the, the, uh, the need to want to make something as opposed to learn something. So we did a kind of a, a small cylinder that was probably about 8 to 12 inches tall. And each one had to have a line, had to have plas plasticity and texture. And then other ones had to have line and texture, line and plasticity, and so forth and so on. We mixed them up that way. So I kind of removed the preciousness out of trying to create an object. And then we were learning the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So they were learning as I was learning. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of neat. 
So I owe a lot to that experience. And um, it was kind of, uh, this show that I have here right now is kind of uh, a mix of my DNA and their DNA, mm -hmm. the students' DNA, mm -hmm. the creative so, so DNA. So teaching really yeah. has offered, a, given you a lot of content and helped to understand your own work better. I think it's interesting, you initially saw this painting as a child and you thought you sort of filed away the notion of painting and then you spent a career of making stuff out of clay and mud and material. That was a comfortable media I was working with. For how many years? 30, 40 years you've been making things out of clay? Oh, I probably about 30 years, something like that. And now the switch is But during gone. that, yeah, but was, you know, it was a lot of other things that were happening with the clay. Uh, I was learning how to work with energy hmm. uh, and how to project energy. I did a sh I did an exhibition here, a one-man show. It was based on one of the fellow faculty. His name was Bill Starna, anthropologist. Hmm. And I approached him if it would be okay if I could do a portrait of him. And um, uh, he said, "Yeah, that would be great." And I says, "But I'm, it's a non-traditional kind of approach." Well, what what your what are you <laughs> what are you looking at? And I said, "Well." I'm aware of how people try to project energy and how they try to communicate with one another. And not only, um, often though, it's, it's in a, a, a way of trying to exert their power over another individual. And I learned that when I was watching Richard Nixon back in the 60s when he was trying to communicate with the American public and he was always doing the mm -hmm. hand thing and using his hands and things. And so I worked a series with him as the uh, the subject, and I did, because 60s was kind of a funky time, and um, uh, and I did a lot of these kind of flippant, funky kind of sculptures, and they were dealing with Richard Nixon's uh, attempt at trying to project with the to the public his ideas, and he came across to me as not very credible, and so I was kind of making fun of him a little bit with these sculptural things. Now with Starna. I wanted to do how he would project his energy as an individual. So I used not only just the hand, but I, I zeroed in on the index finger. So I made these large index fingers that were copies of photographs we did of Charlie Winters and I did photographs of his index finger. And uh, we did these, these sculptures that were close to four feet tall. And I would inject into the tip of the finger different things that I, in conversation I had with him, like for instance, I had a, a discussion with him over a small artifact that I saw in his office. And I said, geez, you know, that looks like it might be a toucan's beak. I says, is there any possibility that the Indian nation could have had contact with a, with a, mid, a Central American uh, uh, Indian tribe? That's not possible, not possible at all. And I was just in Mexico, mm. in Guatemala, and I happened to see some of the artifacts that were down there. And I also visited the Cahokia Indian mounds outside of uh, St. Louis and East St. Louis, Illinois, and learned that their trade routes reached all the way down in Central America, all the way to the West Coast, all the way to the East Coast, and came up into the North Midwestern part of the country. And I thought, geez, if they've come all the way to the Carolinas, surely they may have had some contact with the northern tribes. And he says, that's not possible. So he says, that's a hawk's beak. So I ended up making this sculpture that was, you said toucan, and I said hawk. And uh, I, you know, I, I kind of got through with that one. I, I was happy about that. And, but uh, uh, so this energy thing is important to me. And uh, in line, plasticity and all of that is very important to me as well. And, but the, the difficulty is trying to put it together into a canvas-like form, although I didn't want to use traditional canvas. I, so I make my own, I make my own um, uh, frames. I put plywood on them. I put sometimes canvas on them and I sometimes use foam. I, I, I kind of skip around just a little bit depending upon what, uh, what method uh, I want to use. And um, I build up on them with plaster and I sand the plaster down and I uh, use, um, uh, I'm still working with plasticity. Mm -hmm. and I sand the plaster down and uh, before I sand the plaster down, I often will make uh, gestural marks in it. And these, I've always been intrigued by numbers. I've always been intrigued by uh, um, uh, 
I don't know how the I don't know how I got into using X's, but it was something that I started using in, at Cranbrook when I was in graduate school, and all my ceramic work, and um, it's a very important image to me. And uh, I, I, historically, if I go back, uh, I can probably uh, find out why, but uh, I'd rather not. I just like I just I just feel comfortable using it, and so I use. Um, I use a lot of X's on my surfaces and a lot of numbers and uh, uh, I also have the, the, sometimes I will have the experience when I'm working that you've heard the word zone, getting mm, into the zone. Sure. There's a, a football player from the uh, Chicago Bears who first used the term back in the 60s. Mm. I mean, it might be Sayers possibly, mm. set records. Right. And um, I heard the term and I experienced it a couple times when I was in in college on uh, athletic field, you know, on track while I was a hurdler. And there were times where I would actually not be aware of, I was aware of the starting, but I was aware of the finish, but I really wasn't aware of what was in the, in the middle. And that, that scared me a couple times because of that. It was kind of like you're floating and everything's in slow motion. And sometimes when you paint, the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. You start off with a basic concept, a basic idea, a nugget of something, and you start and it happens and you step back and you're just, where did that come from? And but yet you, you begin to look at it and you say, ah, travel, family content, there's your numbers in there. And you've made these decisions, but you've made them in a, in a very, very subconscious manner. It doesn't happen on all of them, but it does happen sometime. Well, you've certainly had a fidelity to material, uh, a belief in material, responding to the material for its nature. And I, I know in your ceramics work, the texture has always been really critical. Um, so that I see extending into the current work we have in the show too. You're still dealing with the texture and, uh, and, and integrity with the material you're using. So, There's one other thing that I want to add that to all this. When I was at Cranbrook, one of the things they asked you to do is to write a thesis, plus have a one-man show. And when they wanted you to write a thesis, you had to, of course, you were on your own to do this. And so I did my thesis in two parts. One was a technical part, and the other part was the straight honesty part. And, and Maybe we can address some of the, more of that a little bit later on in, in the next segment. We're going to need to go to take a, a, a short break. I guess we're supposed to keep... Welcome to my block party. Glad you can make it. The only triple doubles you get come with fries. I can do this all day. Your moves are just gay. <laughs> Using gay to mean dumb or stupid, not cool. Not cool. Not in my house, not anywhere. It's not creative, it's offensive to gay people. And you're better than that. Closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. I'm talking with artist Dan Young about his current show in the Martin Mullen Art Gallery at SUNY Oneonta. 
So Dan, one thing that I'm really interested to hear about is the influence, the environment, um, the lay of the land, what you see in the Midwest that influences your new work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing it has a lot to do with it. Can oh, you yeah. share lot. with us some of, it, some of what that is uh, environmentally or visually, the okay. things that you're responding to? Okay. I knew that when I moved from here and going to the Midwest, it was going to be a huge risk for mm -hmm. me creatively because I had no idea that I was I was attracted to that area out there very much but I had no idea what the future would have to hold mm. for me to do that move out there and I've been sort of gradually removing clay from my experience slowly but surely and I had a kind of a reduction atmosphere going mm. with my work in terms of dropping off and doing less not not work but less and less glazes less and less uh, different uh, technical things with clay and getting down to the raw material and learning as I go with uh, all the things we discussed earlier with line and all that but I'm uh, moving out there I, I I wanted to make a commitment to the area because one the natural surroundings we live right on the very very edge of the prairie mm -hmm. right where it's incredible it's right where the land will change from more of a flat farmland right into hilly hmm. and we actually live on the edge of a lake a very very large lake and uh, it makes the transition there and goes into the Ozark Mountains and everything after that and a lot of the a lot of the area there and around there reminds me a little bit of New York State hmm. and it's really quite beautiful I like that there for that reason the prairie where the prairie meets right up against the Ozark Plateau and uh, I um, also liked it because of the close proximity to Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, mm -hmm. and those are places I really enjoyed traveling to whenever I got a chance. In fact, we just came back this past spring, early, well, late uh, winter, early spring, to uh, Big Bend National Park. It's one of my favorite destinations. It takes two days to get there, but it's a nice place to be. Very inspirational. And also there's a lot, we live right there on the edge of this lake and we liked it because of the purity of the water. It is, uh, they do not allow anything to be built up uh, commercially within a quarter mile of the shoreline. So it's forever wild all the way around it. And that's really neat. We have, we actually have mountain lions there and occasional bear. We have bobcats. And uh, so f to me, that is an incredible experience environment to be in. I really like that energy, that, mm. that, that natural energy that I find. And um, uh, also a little bit mild in the winter is a little bit more mild. The, the, the winters are kind of like your springs here. And uh, I do a lot of work outdoors. Mm. I have a two-story garage, uh, it's a two-story studio uh, with a garage door on the bottom end mm. uh, that kind of builds into a hillside a little bit. And I open up that garage and I walk right out in that, that concrete area and I can do a lot of work outside. Uh, a lot of that plaster work that I do is outside there. So is, is your work um, a direct response to your observation in the prairie and these, you know, mm -hmm. a, a lots of different experiences you're talking about traveling. And so does the work somehow bring those experiences onto the surface? Is that what you're hoping to or do yeah or? yeah well being that close to nature and I mean we really have nature uh, we have a lot of snakes we have a mm. lot of bobcats in fact I'd followed a bobcat just this past winter as he walked in mm. front of me down towards my mm. studio and came around the backside oh, wow. completely a well he knew I was there yeah, yeah. but uh, I enjoy that kind of energy and of course I do a lot of landscaping I plant a lot of trees and things and I take this all this energy that 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 I have doing all this and I bring it into the studio and I, I use it as inspiration. Mm -hmm. Now when I do a painting, or I start a series, I'll start a series, okay. and it's usually three, at least a minimum of three pieces. And my series, that's another whole story, but my series can actually go on for years mm -hmm. in pockets of, of working in threes. Mm -hmm. And I will start with a, with a basic idea of uh, like Winter's Flock, which is uh, an experience that I had where I came across uh, uh, in, the, in the spring of the year, we were driving around uh, on the prairie a little bit and went down this one lane and it was all uh, snowing a lot 
and in the trees were these uh, redbirds, and they were in there. I've never ever seen this only once in my life. It's one of those life, once in a life experiences. There had to be over a hundred male cardinals, my grouped word. together, all flocked. And I never, th I never thought that I've that never happened. Seen like that. It was very, very unusual. And we sat there and watched them in amongst the snow that was all piled up on the branches. And here you had all this beautiful white clouds moving by with a little blue, black, of course, on the on the Osage orange trees. Hmm. and all the chatter, of course, that was going along with it. Hmm. And that, that experience stuck with me and uh, is kind of a jumping off point to, to use in my paintings. And I interpret mm -hmm. it, the energy that I, that I see there, I interpret it in color, line, texture, mm -hmm. all these different mm -hmm. things that I bring into play. And, and um, uh, I, I like to work in series of uh, three because I'll start with a general idea and I'll say, geez, you know, I think I can tweak this a little bit and get a little bit more, little bit more out of it, color-wise or line-wise or energy-wise, and then I'll move on to the next one, and I'll get a little bit more, a little bit more experimental with it, and then the third one be maybe as experimental as I possibly can. Uh, this series can can take maybe um, two days, three days, it depends on the size of it, and. Um, but that's how I work with, uh, with idea and uh, series. You know, your cardinal experience is really illuminating, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear about that story. I hadn't heard that before. The other thing that I really want to ask you about is hmm. your decision to make a painting that's in response to, or maybe, maybe the painting came first, to the more... Um, tornado that's uh, experienced that's recently happened oh. in the southwest it's a mm -hmm. terribly tragic experience that we you know from the northeast we just sort of watch from a distance but you're you're right there in tornado sort of country how does that painting can you kind of talk about that what you, you, you saw or what you've experienced or what you're trying well, to put in that painting first of all i've experienced tornadoes yeah. i've okay. experienced them i've been right across the street when one wow. came through one Easter <laughs> in a small town called Lockwood, Missouri. And uh, I literally was in, I was, I, was, um, I was in the bedroom, in the front bedroom, and uh, with my two daughters, and it was bedtime. And uh, it was, the, the, the noise on the roof was, mm -hmm. the rain coming down was very, very heavy. But the curtains weren't even moving, it was just, just quiet. And, um, my father-in-law said, Dan, come here, I want you to look at something. So I went in the living room and he was looking out the front do door and I happened to see this water. There was a light with these gooseneck lights coming up over the roadway and the water, I couldn't figure out what was happening, but the water was actually going up and not coming down. Oh my. And at, I, 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 it didn't, you know, it just didn't yeah, compute yeah. on me. And finally I realized what was happening and sure enough, a tornado just went right across the street. My. So I, I know what a tornado is like. I know, I know the damage it can do. And we've had them around, well, the Stockton area there had a large mm -hmm. tornado that came through and devastated the town. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, they rebuilt and uh, uh, got things back and everybody's kind of settled in. And we've had, we've had atmospheric changes around the house. So I, I'm very much where the garage doors will actually mm -hmm. blow out. My neighbor had that experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had it close to that experience when I opened up my utility door one day when we had a storm coming through and uh, opened up the utility door and literally from the garage and literally blew me back uh, into the room. So there was a huge atmospheric change, but we didn't experience a tornado, but it was very, very close to it. So I, I you know, you feel all these different things and you feel for the, you feel for the people who, especially the young kids where the elementary schools were at and things of this nature. And I, 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 I kind of have this need to express this kind of experience and I do it in painting. And so that was that one that was done, uh, that was called uh, Moore, yeah. Oklahoma. Moore, Oklahoma, I think. That. But I, you know, that, that's kind of the, I, the, sh the nut yeah. of it, but it's, there's more to it than that, though. Sure, sure. And it, it, to me, it, it really does um, have a very brooding and powerful expression. And I'm thrilled that we could have such a current painting in the show that is you know, sort of fresh, really, on our minds. Um, so uh, when I traveled out west, one of the things I really, really just was in awe of is when you're out in like the desert area and you see these storms coming in and you yeah. can see the rain at a distance 
And that used to really drive me crazy as to how can I ever capture that? <laughs> how can I ever yeah. tap into that energy? Yeah. Capturing the essence of nature on canvas and work is, is a wonderful thing to, to do. And, and I think you've done it in many, many ways. So, Well, Dan, it's been really great talking about your inspiration and your artwork. Um, much more than we can possibly talk about today. Maybe there's one last closing statement you'd like to make before we... Um, well, I could... I could make reference to the something I got involved with for it's part of my thesis many years ago in the word honesty mm. in my work and I had no idea at that time I knew what honesty meant to me at that time but as time went on this word stuck and uh, constantly trying to strip away now it's to the point where honesty means to me stripping away all the unnecessary particles of information and getting right down to the root of the of the subject matter that you really want to mm. present. So you present all your paints honestly, you present your lines as honestly as possible and remove anything that's uh, unneeded. Mm. And, and that's about where I'm at with that now. I can't think of a better way to end our discussion. Uh, honesty and material and content and meaning and desire and also honesty and what you want people to get out of your paintings and your work is a, just I think a perfect way to end our discussion. I want to thank you again for loaning us your work, for putting in so many hours of helping me set it up in the gallery. It's been really wonderful working with you in that regard, and I appreciate your help tremendously. I think we've got a really gorgeous show for people to come to see. So thank well, you and, and Carolyn for um, hauling it all up here. It's been really terrific. And well, I, would, I want to thank you, but I also want to thank all the students over the years that I had. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you for joining me for this arts edition at SUNY Oneonta in discussion. This and other episodes may be found on Oneonta YouTube page. Gallery hours and information on upcoming shows may be found on our website below. I'm Tim Sheasley. Thank you for watching and remember to take time and experience the arts and visit the galleries. Thank you.